The Galveston hurricane of 1900 was the deadliest natural disaster in United States history. And while many people are aware of that hurricane and the loss of life that was involved, far fewer know of the amazing effort made by the citizens of Galveston and engineers to literally raise the height of the island in order to prevent such loss of life in the future. The Great Seawall and the raising of the grade of Galveston Island is an engineering marvel and history that deserves to be remembered. A barrier island, Galveston, Texas sits approximately two miles off the coast and in the Gulf of Mexico. Because of its unique location, the city has been subject to many storms throughout history that sweep through the western part of the Gulf. Its location made it the most prosperous city in Texas for a time and a bustling port for international trade. Galveston even briefly served as the capital of the Republic of Texas for its interim government in 1836. Galveston, or what its residents simply called the island, set the standard for technological development in Texas during its golden era. It was home to, among other things, the first naval base in the state, the first post office, the first parochial school, or Salina Academy, the first chapter of a Masonic order, the first gas lights, the first telephone, electric lights, the first Roman Catholic hospital, St. Mary's Hospital, the first orphanage, and the first medical college and nursing school in Texas. But these promising developments suffered a serious blow on September 8, 1900, when the hurricane, also called the Great Storm, struck. Isaac Klein was chief meteorologist for Galveston, with the U.S. Weather Bureau, which would eventually become the National Weather Service. He was on the island establishing a new weather station and assisting in the organization of the Texas section of the Weather Bureau. In 1891, Klein had written an editorial in the Galveston Daily News, stating his professional opinion that the possibility of a hurricane seriously damaging the island was a crazy idea. Historians say his editorial was part of the reason that Galveston town leaders decided against building a seawall. The Great Storm was recorded when it passed over Cuba, but ships did not have wireless communication at the time, and the Weather Bureau had little information about the storm as it passed over the Gulf of Mexico, not knowing that the storm had steered towards Texas and had significantly strengthened. Klein, who was monitoring the rising winds and water, broke Weather Bureau protocol by issuing a hurricane warning without getting authorization from Bureau headquarters in Washington, D.C. Concerned at the size of the swells and suspecting that a major storm was approaching, he hoisted the hurricane warning flags the day before the storm. It is unclear how many lives his warning saved. The punishing winds, estimated to be some 140 miles per hour at landfall, and rising tide flooded the entire island under 8 to 15 feet of water. Historians estimate that six to 8,000 people lost their lives on the island itself and thousands more on the mainland in the deadliest recorded storm in U.S. history. Survivors' first-hand accounts are preserved by the Rosenberg Library and Museum in Galveston, Texas. The stories include slate tiles being ripped off roofs and turned into deadly projectiles by the wind. Entire homes were swept off their foundations and into the ocean or slammed into the neighboring houses. A young girl described in a handwritten account waiting out the storm in the bathroom of the second story of her family's home. The next day, she remembered seeing a body left on the front lawn. The nuns at the St. Mary's Orphan's Asylum, located on a beachfront, fought bravely to save the children in their charge. A survivor said he saw the storm surges were eroding the sand dunes as though they were made of flour. The nuns gathered the children into the girls' dormitory because it was newer and, they believed, safer than the boys' dormitory. They all sang the French hymn, Queen of the Waves, in an effort to remain calm. After the boys' dormitory completely washed away, the nuns escorted the children to the second story of the girls' dormitory and tied themselves and the children together with clothesline. But when the foundation lifted from the ground and the roof collapsed upon them, ten nuns and ninety orphans were killed instantly or swept out in the storm surge. Only three children survived. Members of the Congregation of the Sisters of Charity of the Incarnate Word still remember the deaths of the nuns and children each September 8th by singing Queen of the Waves. Beyond the catastrophic death toll, which some historians estimated almost a fifth of the population at the time, the city was in ruins. Approximately half of the homes on the island had been destroyed. Property losses were estimated to be between 28 and $30 million in 1900, representing more than a billion dollars in today's dollars. The day after the storm, one of the survivors said, Such a scene of desolation has met the eyes of the people of Galveston when day dawns Sunday, September 9th, has rarely been witnessed on earth. Beneath these masses of broken buildings, in the streets, in the yards, in fence corners, in cisterns, in the bay, far out across the waters on the mainland shores, everywhere, in fact, were corpses. To bury the dead was a physical impossibility. 
Officials tried dumping bodies out to sea, but many washed back. So the city had to burn huge funeral pyres on the beaches. Isaac Klein would regret his public comments about Galveston not needing a seawall. His wife, who had been pregnant with their fourth child, was among those who lost their lives in the disaster. Klein said, This being my first experience in a tropical cyclone, I did not foresee the magnitude of the damage it would do. He relocated with his remaining family to New Orleans and spent the rest of his life perfecting the science of long-range forecasting to provide the storm warnings and save the lives he could not save in Galveston. When President McKinley was alerted to the disaster, he wrote to the people of Galveston, The reports of the great calamity which has befallen Galveston and other points on the coast of Texas excite my profound sympathy for the sufferers, and they will stir the hearts of the whole country. I have directed the Secretary of War to supply rations and tents upon your request. Despite his offer, much of the cost to rebuild Galveston was borne by its residents and Texas, with charitable donations coming from other individuals or private organizations. A group of prominent citizens banded together and declared martial law for the island in the days following the massive storm because some had been caught robbing from the dead or profiteering from their neighbor's misfortune. In November 1901, a convention was held to appeal to Texas Governor Joseph D. Sayers to replace Galveston's municipal government with a committee appointed by the governor. Some say attendees at the convention blamed the current Galveston leadership for the sudden downturn in the city's fortunes. Sayers took their recommendation. One of the first acts of Galveston's new local government was to appoint a board of engineers and task them with coming up with a plan to protect the island from any future storms that could blow their way. The three engineers selected were Henry Martin Robert, Alfred Noble, and Henry Clay Ripley. Robert, a former member of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and a retired Army Brigadier General, is perhaps best remembered for being the author of the seminal work, Robert's Rules of Order, which has been called the most widely used reference for meeting procedural and business rules in the English-speaking world. Noble had extensive experience in this type of project required in Galveston, as he had helped raise parts of Chicago and was part of the team that chose the route for the Panama Canal. Ripley, who was a member of the Galveston Corps of Engineers, knew the island well as he had helped to construct its jetties and also assisted in creating the Houston Shipping Channel that runs nearby. In conjunction with the residents of Galveston, the civil engineers began an ambitious, almost unthinkable construction project that would not only include a massive seawall and causeway, but to raise the city's grade, literally, to raise Galveston Island. J.M. O'Rourke and Company of Denver was hired for construction of a 17,593 foot long seawall that would stretch three miles along the seaward side of the island. This enormous wall weighed an estimated 40,000 pounds per foot. The American Society of Civil Engineers said that this wall was built to stand 17 feet above the average low tide measurement and gave much needed protection to the island. Two specifically modified 16 by 34 foot rail cars moved on a track that had been built along the wall's length. The rail cars were fitted with boilers, engines, concrete mixers, and derricks, each featuring a 26-foot-long boom that could deliver raw materials in containers full of mixed concrete. The Society lists the astonishing amount of materials to construct the wall as 5,200 railway carloads of crushed granite, 1,800 carloads of sand, 1,000 carloads of cement, 1,200 of round wooden pilings, 4,000 of wooden sheet pilings, 3,700 of stone riprap, and 5 carloads of reinforcing steel. An embankment was built up behind the concrete wall, and then the seawall itself was eventually extended on either side to shelter Galveston even more. In addition to the seawall, the city itself was raised to protect it from future storm surges. Quarter mile square sections were enclosed by dikes, and then everything within that area was raised with hand turned jack screws, including not only entire buildings, but also utilities like sewer, water, and gas mains. The 3,000 ton St. Patrick's Church was lifted five feet using 700 jack screws. Through careful planning, the engineers managed to raise the utility lines without disrupting service to the city. The approximately 16.3 million cubic yards of sand that was used to raise Galveston was dredged from the island's harbor and transported along a 20-foot deep, 200-foot wide, and 2.5 mile long canal excavated specifically for that purpose. A slurry of water and the fill sand was sailed down the canal to discharge stations. The mixture was then pumped into the area to the desired level, and then the water drained away, leaving the sand behind. New foundations were constructed for the buildings, and the structures were then fastened to their new bases. More than 2,000 buildings had to be raised, including churches, schools, 1,226 cottages, 413 one-story houses, and 162 stables. The grade was made at a slope. It was 16.5 feet at the seawall, supporting the wall, but decreased as it went towards the bay, ending at 8 feet 
along the city streets to drain into the bay. A side benefit of taking the sand from the harbor was that larger ships would be able to utilize Galveston's harbor in the future, whereas before the water had been too shallow for larger vessels to use. The entire project, from the seawall construction to raising the island, was finally completed on August 8, 1910 with a final price tag of approximately $3.5 million. Adjusting for inflation, that would be a jaw-dropping $94 million today. Still, investors no longer trusted Galveston in the same way, and the opening of the Houston Ship Channel further moved commerce north. The Great Storm is seen as the end of Galveston's Golden Age, and the beginning of what was called the Open Age, where Galveston became more of a leisure destination than an important port of commerce. The island was never the same. Though the city was safer from the damaging sea waves, it looked barren, and so city residents began planting trees and flowers. Many may have obtained their plants from George Seeley Jr., a Galveston resident who owned a 14-acre oleander nursery on the island, in which he had cultivated over 60 different types of flowers. The Women's Health Protective Association of Galveston planted an estimated 10,000 trees and 2,500 oleanders in a massive beautification project after the raising. Their efforts led to one of Galveston's nicknames, the Oleander City. The great storm of 1900 continued across the United States and actually strengthened as it came across the Midwest. It brought 84 mile per hour winds to Chicago. It did significant damage to Buffalo, New York. It killed nearly 200 people, mostly in ships at sea, when it struck the east coast of Canada 16 days after having made landfall in Galveston. The effectiveness of the Galveston seawall was tested by a storm of similar strength and path in 1915. The storm damaged the wall, did significant damage to the parts of the town not protected by the wall, but damage was significantly less than in 1900, although 53 people on the island died in the storm. In 2001, the American Society of Civil Engineers recognized the Galveston seawall and grade raising as a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark Program, and the seawall itself is on the National Register of Historic Places. Isaac Klein dedicated the rest of his life to better understanding severe weather so that he could better warn people about incoming storms and floods. His careful analysis of observational data of 20 years of tropical cyclones in the Gulf that was published in the 1926 book Tropical Cyclones revolutionized the scientific understanding of the nature of hurricanes and better prepared scientists to be able to warn people about the path that a hurricane might take, saving countless lives. Today, the highest award offered to employees of the National Weather Service is called the Isaac M. Klein Award, in his honor. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.